صباح الخير واهلا وسهلا بكم في جورجتان جود مورنينغ ويلكم تو ذس وندرفل انستيتيوشن جورجتان يونيفرستي ان قطر In fact, more specifically, the School of Foreign Service in Qatar. Um, I want to introduce, at the beginning of this launch of the international history major, the only international history major in the whole of the region, I want to start by introducing Professor Carol Benedict, who is sitting there on my right. Professor Benedict has come all the way from Washington, from Georgetown in Washington, to be with us here on this auspicious occasion. She holds a PhD from Stanford University, and she is professor of history at the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service and the Department of History at Georgetown University. She teaches modern China and world history, and she serves as the department chair of history there. For those of you less familiar with Georgetown as an institution, there are several schools and departments. The School of Foreign Service, which we are a part of, is one of them, but many professors have dual roles in the School of Foreign Service and a department in another discipline, in this case, history. Professor's, Professor Benedict's research focuses on the social and cultural history of 19th and 20th century China, with a particular focus on the history of the social history of medicine and disease, women and gender history, and the history of Chinese consumer culture. Her publications include a book called Bubonic Plague in 19th Century China, that was published by Stanford University Press in 96, and another book called Golden Silk Smoke, a history of tobacco in China between 1550 and 2010, published by the University of California Press in 2011. This book was awarded the American Historical Association's 2011 John Fairbank Prize in East Asian History. And the book was also a finalist for the 2013 Southeast Conference of the Association for Asian Studies Book Prize. Dr. Benedict? The mission of the Undergraduate Bachelor of Science program in the School of Foreign Service is to provide a broadly based liberal arts curriculum with an interdisciplinary focus in international affairs. The study of history plays a central and distinctive role in any strong liberal arts curriculum. And it is essential for the study of international relations. History has thus been a cornerstone of the School of Foreign Service curriculum since its founding in 1919. The major in international history, what we call IHIS, in the School of Foreign Service is rooted in the history of diplomacy and international relations, but it goes well beyond the study of formal relations between states to address themes in comparative, international, and global history. Interdisciplinary in focus, the major draws on ideas and methodologies as diverse as anthropology, philosophy, sociology, political science, religious studies, and literature, to name just a few. International history focuses above all on exchanges and interactions between societies and the historical transformations that affect not just in individual nations, but the world more broadly. The primary goal of an international history major is to prepare students to better understand how our interconnected, globalized world came into being and the forces that will govern its ongoing evolution. History, 
the integrated study of the diverse elements of human experience as they changed over time is intrinsically interesting. And well-written history is beautiful in and of itself. But the study of history is also immediately relevant in the world today. Studying history fosters a greater appreciation for the immersed diversity of the human experience, both in the past and in the present. It enhance, enhances empathic learning by expanding our understanding of peoples and cultures in distant times and places that are very different from ourselves. By reflecting on the experiences of those who came before us, we come to better understand who we are as individuals, as nations, and as human beings. History also speaks to the present by complicating simplistic understandings of contemporary issues. Historically uninformed citizens and leaders are severely hampered in making sound judgments about current events and future policies. When a country's at peace, how else do they understand complicated issues like war unless they study past conflicts? If we know where we came from, we can better navigate where we are going. History can also inspire us to give back to our local, our national, and our global communities because it teaches us that individuals, whether acting alone or in concert, have made a difference in the world. As an interdisciplinary major rooted in the discipline of history, the international history major at SFS in Doha exposes students to a range of theoretical tools and methodological approaches and places special emphasis on the development of critical thinking oral argumentation, and writing skills. These skills are, in value, are valued by every profession, but students who major in international history pursue a wide range of careers in business, teaching, journalism, law, consulting, government, academia, and so on, just to name a few. International history majors thus acquire knowledge and skills that help them develop as informed, engaged, and thoughtful citizens. The study of international history enables students to become more involved with the complex, interconnected world that we live in and to maintain throughout their lives a spirit of inquiry and curiosity that can make them active participants in their communities. But it can also provide them the foundation for an intellectually fulfilling life. In the words of the French-born American historian Jacques Barzin, quote, the study of history is not to make us clear for the next time, but to make us wiser for all time. And now I would like to introduce the curricular chair of the international history major here at Georgetown University of Foreign Service in Qatar, Corrine Walther, who will be introducing the history faculty members. Dr. Walther is an assistant professor in American history, and she obtained her PhD degree from Columbia University. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Let me now introduce you to our history faculty here at SFSQ. May I ask the historians to stand up when I introduce you? I'd like to begin with Dr. Amira Sanbal, our most senior historian here at SFSQ. Professor Sanbal teaches Middle Eastern history. She obtained her PhD from Georgetown University. I won't have time to introduce all of her books because I would be here all day, so I'll just mention a few. These include New Mamluks, Egyptian Society and Modern Feudalism, Women of Jordan, Islam, Labor, and the Law, and most recently, Gulf Women. Dr. Reza Pirbai is our newly hired world historian. He obtained his PhD from the University of Toronto, and his books include Reconsidering Islam in an Asian Context. Dr. Brendan Hill is our Associate Dean for Student Affairs and also, <laughs> also a professor of European history. His PhD is also from Georgetown University. Dr. Daniel Stoll is our Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. And, 
also a professor of US foreign policy. He obtained his PhD from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. His books include The Politics of Scarcity, Water in the Middle East and International Conflict, Over Water Resources in Himalayan Asia, co-authored with Robert Worsing. Dr. James McGregor is an Assistant Dean of Academic Affairs <laughs> and also Professor of Medieval European History. He received his PhD from the University of Cincinnati. Dr. Abdallah El Arroyan <laughs> Assistant Professor of Middle Eastern History, obtained his PhD from Georgetown University. His book, Answering the Call, Popular Islamic Activism in Egypt, 1968 to 1981, will come out with Oxford University Press in 2014. Dr. Phoebe Musandu, Assistant Professor of African History, <laughs> received her PhD from UCLA. Dr. Max Oitman, Assistant Professor of Chinese History joins us from Harvard University where he just received his PhD. And finally, Dr. Edward Kola uh, unfortunately could not be with us today because he's currently actually in the archives conducting research for his upcoming book on the French Revolution. Professor Kola earned his PhD from Johns Hopkins University and teaches European history at SFSQ. Now we will have our first speaker, Professor Reza Pire, give a brief talk on the relevance of international history for the Middle East. Professor Pire. Good afternoon, everyone. Rather than provide an example of international his history to illustrate its relevance to the Middle East, I thought I would approach the issue by drawing lessons from um, my own experiences as a teacher of world history and a researcher in that field as well. As Professor Benedict uh, just informed us all, international history at Georgetown University in Washington grew out of the field of diplomatic history. Uh, the chief distinction, as she also clarified to me in a workshop very recently, between international history and diplomatic history is that while diplomatic history concentrated on state-to-state state -state relations, international history is intended to take a decidedly more trans-regional approach, incorporating some of the approaches of another field in which I am ensconced, world history. Now, world history is a rather new field. In the United States, a series of factors prompted its rise no earlier than the 1980s. As the economy of the United States became increasingly internationalized through the 60s and 70s, the need became apparent for Americans to be more aware of the world around them and their place in it. The education system, however, both at the secondary school and university level, concentrated on national U.S. history, or when concerned with earlier dates, that of Europe through such courses as um, Western civilization. To be sure, non-Western history also flourished, particularly in the form of area studies. Comparative history also catered to the need for interregional perspectives, while diplomatic history provided the same on a more state-to-state -state level. The obvious problem, however, was that at the grade school level, only national and Western history was integrated into the curriculum. Area studies, comparative history, and diplomatic history, meanwhile, required university-level education. As a field, therefore, world history evolved out of the need to introduce students to the world at an earlier stage in their education. As the renowned historian Peter Gran has put it, world history, in fact, grew out of the classroom. This evolutionary trajectory, however, raised problems of its own, the greatest of which has been that while the world was added to various curricula by the 1980s, the assumptions underlying its presentation remained rooted in earlier approaches. That is to say, first of all, the approach remained largely civilizational. The world continued to be presented as discrete civilizations, easily compared but not necessarily connected. Europe or the West continued to provide the focus of study. Non-Western civilizations were understood as they contributed to Europe or as Europe influenced them. 
and perhaps most importantly, Europe or the West, conceived in the above terms, provided the standard for civilization. The further and other part of the world's thought and institutions were judged in relation to the Western, the more emphatically they were included in that historical narrative as far from civilization itself. A perfect example of this approach, in my opinion, is Samuel Huntington's clash of civilizations. Suffice it to say, world history remained Eurocentric. With its growth as a field since the 1980s, however, self-criticism and theoretical challenges from outside the field have yielded a number of promising hopes, if not always, as Huntington illustrates, results. Those hopes, I believe, are rooted in two basic modifications in the approach that historians now take. First of all, the very idea of civilizations, the notion of discrete intellectual and institutional traditions disconnected from those around them has been questioned and rethought. Thus, in world history, various parts of the world are not compared as apples and oranges. They are to be seen in relation to each other as fruit, cross-fertilizing and produced by analogous, if not identical, processes. And secondly, the emphasis on European or the Western development uh, that it entails has been replaced by an emphasis on the rise of broader global structures and associations facilitated by urbanization, migration, trade, empire, and so forth. In other words, themes that are viewed in a global context. The result, take my word for it, if you haven't read much world history, is far from Huntington and the notion of clashing civilizations. So what does this all have to do with the relevance of international history to the Middle East? To put it most succinctly, it is nothing less than the region's liberation. Not in a political or economic mode, obviously, but in the more fundamental sense of the emancipation of historical understanding from the false consciousness of ideology. Allow me to illustrate with an anecdote. I have taught world history for many years in the United States. In my last class, <clears throat> as in many previously, a student raised his hand for the first time well into the semester. Sir, he protested indignantly, we've been coming to class for four weeks and you've never mentioned Europe. I had, of course, mentioned Europe in the context of Paleolithic cave art and Neolithic, the Neolithic spread of agriculture, but this was not the student's point. In those four weeks of class, we had covered the rise of the earliest urban cultures from North Africa to East Asia. We had talked of the articulation of religious concepts such as monotheism in the Sahara or the afterlife in Pharaonic Egypt. Theories of government, not restricted to the rise of city-states or empires, but including the notion of the just state had been touched upon in such cases as the overthrow of the Shang by the zoo in China. We'd read on the development of legal principles ranging from the concept of lex talionis to the codification of law in Mesopotamia. Urban planning and public works had been broadly discussed in the context of the Indus Valley. Trade networks has been explored, ranging from the Mediterranean to the Arabian Sea. Migration, both across land and sea, had been illustrated by the movement of the Bantu, Indo-European, and Lapita cultural groups. Reminding the students of these lessons, I responded to his question by pointing out that it is not a function of my bias that Europe is not included in the origins of such foundational aspects of world civilization. It is simply a matter of historical fact that Europe is its latter-day beneficiary. The student promptly dropped my class. <laughs> you can't win them all, right? Had he remained in the class, however, he would have learned that my point was not to neglect, let alone belittle, the role of Europe and Europeans in the history of the world. Rather, my intention, for those like him only interested in European history, was to give them the benefit of the contextualization of that history by separating it from the post-Enlightenment ideology in which he was clearly educated. It is precisely in this sense 
that I speak of the relevance of international history to the Middle East as a factor in the region's liberation, a move away from clashing civilizations, a step beyond understanding the world as a footnote in European history, to conceiving the non-Western world as a co-producer of the modern condition, for better or worse. This, in my opinion, is emancipation indeed. In closing, therefore, I would like to thank SFSQ for inviting me to join the wonderful faculty already engaged in this task and extend my gratitude to all of you in the audience for taking the time out of your busy schedules to attend this event. Thank you. Okay, um, I was asked to speak about uh, international history, why international history and its significance to uh, SFSQ. I, uh, as I said earlier to the group that was here, I'm very enthusiastic about this and I think that uh, uh, my students who are here will probably tell you uh, that um, I teach very much international history to begin with. It's, uh, my approach has always been this way. My comments today, I'm going to uh, make some comments to show why international history and why it's um, a, a good way or a good venue to explain uh, or to teach history to our students in SFSQ and the wider Middle East. Okay. Uh, in 2012, I published an article in a collection of essays titled Towards the Dignity of Difference, Neither End of History Nor Clash of Civilizations. The purpose of the volume was to revisit the arguments presented by the discourses of Francis Fukuyama's The End of History and Samuel Huntington's um, The Clash of Civilization from within the perspective of contemporary democratic and revolutionary movements and the global black clash uh, against what was becoming hegemonic neoliberalism. The call was for new alternatives to the status quo, a possible paradigm shift in a growing discursively crowded world. The title of my article was Beyond Exceptionalism, Is a Common History Possible? It questioned the very premises of the ideas of Fukuyama and Huntington, seeing them as a continuation in a direct line back to Weber and beyond to Hegel. Their central thesis is the triumph of the West, or as described by Howard Zinn, a notion of superiority, which began in the early days of the American Republic and gained force as it became the world's strongest power. When asked about American exceptionalism, President Obama answered, I believe in American exceptionalism, just as I suspect that the Brits believe in British exceptionalism and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. I'm enormously proud of my country and its role and history in the world. It probably would not have occurred uh, to President Obama that Muslims also believe in Muslim exceptionalism and are enormously proud of their religion and what it has brought to the world. The West's outlook to the Muslim world has been steeped in Orientalism, which causes them to see the East as unchanging and static. Muslims are conceptualized in almost Aristotelian terms, their world waiting for a grand mover in contrast to a Newtonian West, dynamic, always in flux, ready to conquer and better the world. This image of a backward yet exotic Orient makes it difficult for the West to even imagine any sense of equality with its people. This is problematic if there is any chance of relations built on the dignity of difference between West and East. A look at how Muslims perceive themselves and express how they feel about their position in the world shows how steep they are in their own form of exceptionalism. While conservative Muslim discourses disparage those who consider themselves God's chosen, the same voices have made out of their communities God's chosen, the only ones who will be saved and have a chance to go to paradise with a destiny to fulfill God's wishes on earth. Just as Americans see themselves as holding a destiny to better humanity, Muslims believe that they have the answers to a better community built, built on fairness and righteousness. Even while stressing equality of all people in the eyes of God as a central premises of Islam, they consider others incomplete for not having yet embraced Islam. With two such confrontational positions, where do we begin the road toward a dialogue that acknowledges the dignity of difference and promotes dialogue among civilizations? To bridge differences, a new approach is needed, one that takes the roots of the problem into account, 
just as American exceptionalism and the, and the belief in manifest destiny are built on historical narratives, so is Islamic exceptionalism. Each has a long history to be proud of, and notwithstanding efforts at self-criticism, holds on to the fundamentals of the history. The two sides are divided by historical discourses and narratives, and these stand antagonistically against each other. Discourses of difference dominate clashing ideologies, and these discourses are framed around competitive civilizational debates. Differences based on religion, which determines culture, the economy, and everything else. Religion becomes a superstructure, and international relations are determined accordingly. This is one place where international history becomes critical. Already philosophers like Weber or Foucault, who brought about paradigm shifts, have shown one way toward alternative narratives and paradigms by going into detailed analysis of events and discussions involving social and cultural specificities to be able to take us step by step toward constructing the past. Historical events, not just political events, but rather social events in their specificities are utilized to draw a complete picture out of multiple and sometimes contradictory processes and discourses. This methodology serves us well in trying to, com to come up with an alternative approach. To be able to find commonalities between diverse cultures, we would need to go to the base, to social specificities, to the lived realities of people. This does not eliminate the macro picture, rather the micro needs building before we reach general conclusions about culture. This is not a simple endeavor, for it requires extensive research and sifting through materials with a new eye. It also requires open-mindedness and a shift in the expectations of academic and intellectual pursuits. But a start can be made by at least proposing the possibility of a common history of all peoples, certainly of peoples who have been in constant communication throughout their history, as is the case with Europe and the Middle East. Why is the history of these two areas studied as separate history and separate civilizations, when in fact these areas have been exchanging goods, peoples, culture, and ideas over the millennia? Why has historical continuities between the Middle East and Asia, and between Asia and the West, attracted scholarly attention and been the subject of research emphasizing exchange of trade and people? Attention to relations between the Middle East and the West has been predominantly focused on the dominance of the former by the latter. Yet global movements of people due to migrations Invasions, trade, and other reasons over the millennium have been recorded by historians who trace these movements to the earliest times. The Mediterranean was a, Medo uh, was a Roman sea at one time, and even with, uh, with later political division between the north and south shores, when it is sometimes alleged that there was little contact, cultural patterns had great affinities. This was noted by Egypt's dean of intellectual thought, Taha Hossein, in his book, The Future of Culture in Egypt, published in the 1920s. He emphasized Egypt's cultural affinity with Europe, and so it as belonging to the same heritage as that of the Mediterranean world of Romans and Greeks. If we turn to research scholars, we find excellent publications about greater cultural affinities. Here there is great diversity of genres and research resources. A good example is Deborah Howard's study of the impact of Islamic architectural traditions on the city of Venice using various types of primary sources, including travelers' accounts, letters, governmental correspondences and decrees, building permits and deeds of property of the city of Venice, inheritance records, commercial, etc., etc., and pictures of the cities of Venice, Cairo, Aleppo, Damascus, and other cities of the Islamic world, Howard gives evidence to the cultural exchange between East and West, the richness of Islamic heritage that fascinated Venetians of the medieval period who borrowed and bettered the styles they found and incorporated in building their magical city. Further West, Spain was a meeting place, uh, a meeting point between the two cultures, one that was continuous and in which Visigothic, Moorish, Islamic, Christian, and Jewish traditions melded together, sometimes seamlessly and other times cataclysmically, but in constant contact and exchanging people, goods, and knowledge. Nabil Matar's introduction to the narratives of Arab travelers to the West, whose connection to Europe and the New World was through Spain of the 17th century, gives relevance to a new paradigm. Clearly, there was, no, I'm quoting here, clearly there was no sudden discovery of Europe among the Arabs, for as these and other Arabic, uh, Arabic writers reveal, information about the lands and peoples of Christendom was available and transmittable and was based on translation, research, and travel. 
I'd like to end by just giving two examples uh, of what can be done uh, to unlock this idea of separate um, uh, shores or separate sides of these two civilizations. One that I'm still working on, but it has to do with a, a document uh, that shows um, the interest of the French when they came to Egypt. The French army arrived in 1798, and orders were given to the savants to please go out and study the court system in Egypt fully. And they did so. And the document I have is a set of questions that were set of to Qadi al-Arishi, who was the chief Qadi of Egypt, asking him about the court system in Egypt and the answers. This is the beginning of the document. I'm still looking for the rest. But what this shows us is that there is something to be talked about in regard to the diffusion of law and the future coming of the Code Napoleon uh, that is later on going to be re-exported from France into the, into the Middle East. Here, the subject of the fusion of law is very important because we always think of the legal systems as being separate. Actually, there's a, a lot of connections and nobody has yet asked the question, what has the impact of Sharia or courts uh, been on European courts or on the legal system uh, in, in Europe? The second, uh, the second subject or the second um, example uh, you probably, many of you may have heard of uh, Sheikh Jalal al-Din uh, al-Suyuti. I'm not sure if you have or not, but he's a very interesting character. He lived from 1445 to 1505 in Asyut. That's why he's known as the Suyuti. And uh, he is known as a religious thinker and faqih. And he wrote books of tafsir, hadith, uh, fiqh, and Sufism. But what is less known about him are his books on language and linguistics, meanings and lexicons, astronomy, um, literature, jokes, composition, poetry, history, morals, sexuality, sciences. Altogether, he has uh, over a thousand works indexed, and we have located a large percentage of them. He is contemporary to Leonardo da Vinci, and Leonardo da Vinci lived between 1452 and 1519. They're almost uh, lived at the same time. The similarities between what interested the two and the work they undertook is remarkable. While this should not be surprising since they lived during the same years across each other from the Mediterranean, one is, credited, uh, one is credited with the Renaissance and the other is seen as outside of history. Okay, clearly a new perspective toward the history of the Mediterranean is needed and this is one place uh, where international history will play, uh, would play a role. Um, I would like to add here that 80% of known existing Arabic manuscripts available in world libraries have yet to see the light of day. Or to, even, or to even be indexed. When such a feat is accomplished, uh, there is no doubt that a new international history integrating this part of the world with world developments would take place, and that would resolve differences, show historical commonalities to world accomplishments, and hopefully get us closer to an end to discourses of difference. Thank you so much. So, um, you've got a little bit of a taste um, of the sorts of questions that can be discussed in international history and also of the, the sense, the, 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 use, the use of doing international history or um, indeed world history. It's not a, not a coincidence that we made a point as part of our uh, expansion in our numbers of professors that I talked about earlier, that we made a point of going for a professor of, globe, of, of world history.